My name is Roshana Donna Sinclair and I live in Scotland. This is my Pledge of Allegiance. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. I bear witness that Ali and the Imams from his sons are the proof of Allah. I bear witness that the Mahdi and the Mahdis are the proofs of Allah. Upon this I shall live, upon this I shall die, and upon this I shall be resurrected again, inshallah. Thank you. We're joined right now here in the studio with our dear sister, Donna Sinclair, all the way from Scotland. How are you doing, Donna? I'm really well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us here. So we wanted to give a, a bit of insight for the viewers on what it is that you used to believe in before becoming a believer in the call of Abu Sadiq and Imam Mehdi. So what was your religious background before? Um, I was raised as a Catholic, but um, converted to liberal Judaism when I was older, as I found Catholicism quite a challenging religion to believe in. I struggled to believe that Jesus was God, and a lot of the practices that we had in Catholicism seemed almost contrary to the Gospels. Mm. So I lost my faith for quite a considerable time. And being from a, a Christian background, I naturally assumed that if what I was currently being taught was incorrect, perhaps the truth was further back. So that's why I made my way to, to Judaism, which was which was a, a beautiful journey. But ultimately, I, I found that there was quite a lot missing there. Jesus being a main part, but perhaps just not in the sense and, and the way that I'd been taught as a Catholic. So that that's where the whole exploration came from for me, that there was something more out there, that everybody had a piece of the puzzle, but nobody was really putting it together. Right. Hmm. It's interesting. So you started off as a Catholic and then you decided to go and venture into Judaism because you felt like it's more authentic if you go further back into the Abrahamic scriptures and faiths? Yeah, at that time I knew nothing about Islam, so it was the most natural choice for me was to think, well, this is incorrect, but I can still believe in the former. So I went more towards like the, the Old Testament, the Torah. But I, I again, um, I, I found... It not it not having everything it, it was missing a lot right can it's, you give us an example of what you mean by that well when we celebrated all the um, all the festivals as beautiful as they were it, it just seemed like almost on a loop like we hadn't progressed we were still living as, as we were like 2,000 years ago it didn't seem like we were progressing and, and the information wasn't progressing and and the practices weren't progressing and it, and it just seemed a little out of touch. Right. Um, it just um, and I and I the more I looked at the Messiah purely from a Judaic point of view, the more I was like, well, it's Jesus, you know, yeah. it's Jesus, maybe the Son of God, but he is the Messiah. So that's what um, kind of left me in a limbo state where I was I was kind of believing in some of the Christian beliefs and, and some of the J beliefs, but kind of like I didn't have a home, religiously speaking. It didn't make sense to me. So you found that there's like something missing in the idea of not believing in Jesus Christ, but also being part of the Judaic faith. So you wanted to somehow make that make sense. And then you told us before that you um, became a Messianic Jew because of that. I would, that was how I would classify myself. I was very much following all the, the Jewish dietary laws. I was trying my best to respect the Sabbath. Mm. I was um, praying in Hebrew. I would carry around like a little pocket sador and um, try my best to say the correct prayers at the correct time. But it didn't feel particularly authentic. I thought that, that the more I would practice, the more it would feel organic. Mm. Um, and it just, it didn't, I even bought myself a um, tefillin at one point um, to try and to try and become almost more, you know, practicing. And um, and it just, it just felt like I was going through the motions. It didn't feel I was actually connecting with with God in, in the truest sense. It didn't feel like I was, I was really following the, the truth, if you see what I mean. It always seemed like there was a, a greater truth mm -hmm. that I was, that I was missing. So I guess uh, uh, in your exploration and uh, trying to figure out, okay, how does Christianity follow Judaism or how does Judaism follow up with Christianity and you trying to 
uh, see how the pieces of the puzzle fit in. Uh, what made you uh, come across our faith? What made you come across uh, uh, the Ahmadi religion of peace and light? I'm completely by accident. Um, I was scrolling on YouTube one day, um, as you do, and a, a short came up of Abra Sadiq. And I was just kind of blown away with this, probably a minute long, a minute 20 of him speaking. Um, and it, it just it just blew me away. It actually made me stop in, in my tracks and kind of stop scrolling and actually listen to it a few times over. And I thought, this, this is interesting, this is different. And from there, I, I was seeing seeing more um, more pop up on my on my phone, and I actually went in and started to research it and watch the videos. And I never w went in as a as a view that I was going to be changing religions or that this was this this was the way. But it was just something about him that completely drew me in, and the way he spoke, and the the wisdom that he had. And the way he was explaining the stories I'd heard from both a Judaic point of view and a Christian point of view, mm. in, a, in a way that actually made sense. And it was like filling in the gaps. And it just just drew me in. Um, and it was a journey. That's where the journey began, completely by accident. I see. And what was it that, that you, like, what was it that made you inspired then? I mean, okay, you came across the shorts, but then what inspired you to continue uh, forward? Because, you know, when Abu Sadiq does speak and when he does speak from the knowledge which he had received, uh, many Jews and Christians, they tend to draw away from it because it goes against uh, many of the mainstream thought and yes. ideas of what Christianity and Judaism uh, hold on to. So what made you feel like, okay, this has to be the truth and that which uh, I thought of before, uh, has been corrupted or is later in falsehood? It's, the best way I can explain it, it was like giving different piece, piece of a jigsaw puzzle your entire life mm. and finally someone put them pieces together. Mm. He didn't reject the Jewish midrashids. Mm. He didn't reject the teachings of, of Christ. He just explained them in a way that actually made sense and made them fit as a puzzle, but not just for that time, but for our time now. And obviously, there was so much to learn about Islam, which I, which I, I really was lacking in knowledge. So that was a, an entire process. But it, it connected. The way he described that the seven covenants literally linked everything together perfectly in yeah. a way that I, know that this is the truth. So this like is the that. truth that I've been told. Mm -hmm. So it, it was pretty much like he came as an affirmation for for what you already pretty much believed in and what you encountered. Uh, in your belief in Catholicism or in Christianity and in Judaism. So uh, now that you understand uh, what the true calling was, you know, the true calling of God through his messenger, uh, how has that impacted you since the time that you realized that this is the truth compared to uh, what you had been doing in the past? I mean, it's life changing. I, I, it's truly life changing because it means that God's never left us. He's never not left us with a messenger. Yeah. He's, he's never not left us with, with a human being representing his, his will and his teachings, his wisdom on this earth. And it's, and it's, it's amazing that, you know, I thought that all the, all the teachings were in ancient books. I didn't realize that, they, that their actual message had been living in every generation. And that, that's quite life-changing because that inspires you to want to reach out to this human being and to want to follow this human being because that the, the breath of God is, is in this human being and it makes you want to be better, it makes you want to serve, it, it, it fills you with hope and a, a different kind of optimism and a different kind of belief in God that this isn't just about ancient books, this is about flesh and blood mm. living today. Something that's alive basically, not a religion that's not living or not um, like you said, flesh and blood right in front of you. That's what the truth should be. And yeah. that's the basis of this religion. The call of Imam Mahdi is that, that the religion is the man sent by God, isn't it? I think it's inspiring that you, uh, and it shows a lot actually, that you were sincerely looking for the truth because you believed 
that if Judaism and Christianity cannot be linked properly, and of course later Islam, then there must be something wrong there. Uh, and you found that the man from God today, Abu Sadiq, is linking these three, and that's why it must be the case. It's one story, one story of humanity, as he shows in the book, The Goal of the Wise, which I know you've recently ordered a copy for yourself as well. Yeah, I've been working my way through. I read a bit every single day. Um, and reading through the whole seven covenants was amazing. I mean, there, there were bits that I was shook, and there was bits that I was like, oh, my goodness, this, this just pieces it together perfectly. This mm -hmm. explains why the laws of the changes and adapt. And it's never been explained to me so clearly as as this ever. It's it's truly inspirational. And it's the truth. It's the undeniable truth. And that's quite um, a strange thing to, 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 to feel after someone who spent her lifetime searching to actually feel like I've actually, I'm there. That's so beautiful that you've come to that resolution. I, I wonder how how would you, because you mentioned how a lot of um, the teachings or the understandings of, of the religion in Judaism, you found it a bit stagnant or a bit stuck in a certain time period, I think, is how you described it. So what was a day like for you in, in life um, in that faith? What was it, how would you describe it to someone who isn't aware of the religion? I didn't follow particularly an orthodox pattern, but I would wake up and the first prayer I'd say was the Madani, which was um, in Hebrew. I would start my day in prayer. I would get the Sedora. I would. I wasn't very good at Hebrew. I'd say my, my best <laughs> Hebrew prayers. I would say the Hebrew and brackets, the, the blessings over any food that I ate. But it felt like a, a disconnection if that's like I was going through motions. I was almost trying to tick the box and look how good I am at my Hebrew and look, you know, I've remembered this one, rather than actually, I'm actually just praying to God that I'm grateful for the food that I have to eat and for the, the people that I have. And although it was beautiful in a sense, it kept me grounded and appreciative to God, it wasn't authentic and from the heart, if you see what I mean. It was more like just from a book, mm -hmm. repetitive, not authentic. So now that you have come to this faith and this religion, how would you say it's different? What is different in your life? How is it practically affecting your lifestyle in a in a different way? Pray a million times more. Like, I pray a million times more. It's not trying to read from a book and just copy what somebody else has said. It's I now pray authentically from my heart. I'm constantly thanking God. Constantly. I'm not just for the food that I'm eating, but for wonderful little moments throughout the day. Um, I don't think I've ever been so grateful. I'm, I'm not trying to think of it from an academic point of view, it's just coming from the heart. I'm, I'm constantly, I, I think I ask, I used to ask God for like, almost like a strange wish list, which I don't do anymore at all. It's just about gratitude. And the only thing I ask for is the strength to serve. That, that's what I ask for now. That's That's been the biggest change in me, is what can I do for God? Whereas before, I'm ashamed to say, I don't think that's how I thought. So I think I I kind of thought like, hey, if I've done this, I'm, I'm due some good luck here. Whereas now, I kind of look back at that person and think, what was I thinking? You know, my, my job is to serve God. God's given me so many blessings. I should be thanking God constantly. And, and that's what I'm doing now. It's made me more grateful. It's made me more hopeful. And... I want to work towards this divine state. I want to be a part of this process. So uh, one question I do have, since uh, you were in the emotions of, uh, of self-discovery and uh, you have this epiphany now of, uh, since I found the truth, I've been in active prayer more so now. Uh, what was your idea of salvation? Because every religion has an idea of salvation yeah. in Judaism and in Christianity and Islam. Uh, you, so you did convert from Christianity to Judaism, and then you found uh, us, the Ahmadi religion of peace and light. So uh, what was your idea of salvation beforehand, and how do you see salvation now for the people and for yourself? It's very different, to be honest. Um, in Christianity, we were we were taught from a very young age, almost um, a story, but that you're going to come to the gates and there's going to be St. Peter, yeah, and you're going to be judged, and it will be heaven, hell, or purgatory. That was that was how it was presented to me, and um, and you know it was it was lots of little quite frightening stories that you know, with my mum telling me 
that my um, my grandmother had said to her, you better get, like, you know, your children baptized as soon as possible, because if they die, they're going to purgatory, you know, <laughs> which she thought was quite an unpleasant thing to say when she'd just given birth. Um, oh, gosh. And um, from, oh, yeah, but from, from a Judaism point of view, the afterlife was, well, I would, to be honest, it wasn't discuss anywhere near as much as it was in Christianity. There was an idea of you would get to walk with God, but the focus much more was on life than it was the afterlife. So it was a very different perspective, whereas in Christianity it was constantly being taught about heaven and hell. Judaism was very different, and the concept of hell was very different. It was more described as um, a washing machine that your souls would be cleansed. It would be an unpleasant process, perhaps, but you would come out cleansed. It wouldn't be like a permanent um, state. Now I think about heaven and hell as being a complete complete justice, I suppose, for my works on this earth, but also the, I'm more focused on how I'm living to create the state that God wants. And I know whatever happens to me will be what I deserve. And I don't focus on that. I focus on how I'm living and giving every day to God. So that that's how um, I'm less scared of death. Put it put it that way. It will be justice, whatever it will be. That is such a beautiful kind of understanding that you've presented in those words that you've chosen because you've gone through that long journey. You've seen different ways of life and you've still come to this point where uh, it, in the most practical sense, it's the most logical way of life. If you're looking to serve humanity, if you're looking to find that connection between the different peoples in the world, which ideally would be the case if it's the same God of Abraham that we're all worshiping right now, then mm -hmm. that's exactly how it should be, the way you said, that we all are actually one family, one human family, and we have uh, each other to serve in order to better mankind and to serve humanity and make it a better place. Uh, which brings me to my next question. Uh, tell us a little bit about the perspective that you held back when you were uh, a Messianic Jew, when you were believing more in the, the blood ties, so to speak. And can you please compare that for us to what we see in today's day and age to be uh, in this covenant, the soul family or the connection between the souls for the believers? Yeah, no, that's a really good point because I'm um, ethnically just European, so I'm ethnically not Jewish at right. all. And um, so for me, I felt ever so slightly uncomfortable and like a, a fraud. We would celebrate like Passover, and um, I would know that it, it wasn't my bloodline who who came out of Egypt. And um, and we were we we're told that there was a, um, a midrash that if you felt you had a Jewish soul, it was your soul would have been present at Sinai. So that was quite an interesting concept. The Midrash, I think, is more um, from Kabbalah than it is um, from mainstream Judaism. But like you were born with a Jewish soul, that's why you were drawn towards Judaism, which um, I, I'm, I'm not sure was, was true in my case. But like um, I, I, that's how we kind of justified it. When you went through the conversion process, you became Jewish, so you said the same prayers. But you certainly reading through the Torah, it did seem aimed to more towards a specific group of people, like an ethnic group of people. And it was kind of odd that I wasn't ethnically part of that. So mm -hmm. I, it, it was strange. But with the terms of the soul family, it's not about bloodline, it's not about ethnicity, the color of your skin, the, 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 your nationality, where on earth you were born. It's about the soul. It's about the, what's inside of you and you're searching from the truth. and that search for the truth and the purifying yourself in the sense that you are pledging allegiance to the man of the day. That's what makes you a part of the family. And that, to me, makes so much more sense than, than things you can't control, like your, your, your genealogy, the colour of your skin, the, the country of your birth. It, it seems that this makes a lot more sense. It's your soul that connects us. And... Um, and I feel like a lot more authentic in, in this religion because you don't have to pretend to be anything you're not. You're not having to to say, oh, you know, I'm not ethnically Jewish or I'm a convert constantly because to try and explain things. You know, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in, um, when you're a convert in Judaism, if you get called up to say a prayer, they would say your um, Hebrew name and um, the name of your parents, so Batoben, like um, 
whatever your parents' Hebrew names were. But if you're a convert and you get called up to say a prayer, it would be, um, they would say, like, that Abraham and Sarah. And that would be the sign for everyone that you were a convert. Mm. So that would be how, even if, for example, you'd been in a community for, for a long time and they hadn't perhaps realized that you converted, that would be the moment that everybody would know. Oh. And there were stories within synagogues about people being treated differently because of that, because you would be outed in your conversion, whether it was in, not intention or any nastiness meant, but that was just, you'd be like the daughter of Abraham and Sarah as opposed to your actual parents. So I'm. what I love about, about this religion is it's not about ethnicity in the slightest. It's just about, it's not about who your parents were, it's about who you are and what your soul is. And that's, I would think, how it should be. I think that's the truth. It's very fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's pretty tough, actually. It's pretty tough to, like, um, convert to a religion that you feel like has truth in it and to be seen as an outcast by everyone in your circle because mm. you know you weren't born into that group or into that sect and unfortunately it is it is a case uh, me growing up in new york i had uh, many jewish friends who actually said yeah we look at outsiders differently even those who convert we don't really consider them to be uh, part of our circle yeah because and, of the bloodlines yeah, because of the bloodline and and for them it's like okay uh, so this person would only be considered jewish if that person were to die and to reincarnate back into a Jewish family. That's what I was uh, told and that's what was told to me by my Jewish friends back in New York uh, when I was previously living there. So yeah, it is uh, uh, unfortunate, but now that the Qa'im is here and he reveals the soul relations, actually we understand now that the soul ties are much more important than the uh, ties of the body. And that's why even Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees that actually you guys are sons of vipers and you guys are actually sons of the devil rather than the sons of, uh, of Abraham, which uh, is a fascinating connection between us and the true teachings and the true yeah. covenant that God had um, uh, uh, inspired with the prophets and messengers. So I, I'd like to know as well from you, you mentioned um, something very beautiful earlier. You said that we are with the Imam of the time and that's what connects us. That's what unites the believers around the world, regardless of their differences. Uh, could you please, for the sake of the viewers, explain how that would be in terms of your previous faith in Judaism and the stagnancy of the religion that you felt because it doesn't seem to fit in with this day and age and the fact that there is an Imam in every age and time. Why is that necessary? Why is it needed? And how did that help you in your life now? Because it's no longer stagnant, is it? Yeah, it's not, um, it's not us as a small tribe against the world. You know, yeah. like we are um, a, a sort of chosen tribe and we have a special set of obligations to be like the, the light of the world. It's not, it's not that at all. That the Prophet Muhammad came, please be upon him, came for the whole of humanity. And he sent his, he sent his imams, his mahdis, to be present with us and, to, and God is speaking through them to give us the message of the day. It's not for one ethnic group and it's not stagnant as in we have to, we have to look at these stories and interpret them, which I think we still can. There's still so much beauty in them. I'm not saying yeah, that, but... Hmm. But, the, but they can be interpreted and told to us as they're meant to be. We've not been left alone. We have people to guide us here. We have Abraham Sadiq to guide us today. It's, it's a living religion. We're supposed to be involved in it now, not just doing rituals and practices from a thousand years ago. We, we have an imam today to teach us. And it's, it's, religion isn't something that's dead. Religion is very much alive. Well said, very well said. Uh, religion is very much alive. The Imam of the time is present and supporting this call and this cause is actually integral to our religion because we believe in service to humanity, right? Uh, could you explain how that has changed your life? What does it mean to serve humanity and how are we supposed to be supporting this call? What is important about that? Um, supporting this call for me is all about supporting Ever Sadiq him this piece he he is to me the most important person in in the world right now because of what he can do for humanity and we need to support god we need to support him 
that that that's for me and his wisdom his patience his compassion are inspiring so whenever i get an opportunity to do something it could be something as silly as i was walking through an airport last week i saw an empty bottle of water on the floor and picking up so somebody doesn't trip over it now that's something i probably would have ignored and not not thought, uh, thought about and it might seem like a really silly example but there is if if god puts us in a place to be a help even if that's a tiny bit of help you do it because god's put you there to do a good, good deed if you get to help someone who's fallen down if you get to be charitable if you get to be somebody's shoulder to cry on even if it's just picking up a piece of trash from the street you do it because the religion is about being compassionate and about service it's not about your ego or i'm too good for this or that's somebody else's job i i couldn't imagine wanting us to do anything else you know i'd imagine god wanting us to reach out and be of help wherever we can however small or however big and you know maybe in my life it's only going to be small things that i can do to help but i want to do every single one of them that i can and that's how i bear that like, he inspires me and wants me to be that person that's really brilliant mm. that's so brilliant i think you're absolutely right and i don't think it's a small way at all that you're helping i think that you just being aware of the fact that that's how we should be as as a species as a human nation i think that's that awareness in itself is so critical and it's exactly what we're trying to to show and that's exactly what this book is saying and that's the whole message of of the imam of the time is that humanity comes first under the banner of the man appointed by god who can actually establish that kind of creed uh in society and that's what we're supporting here so let's talk about abu sadiq for a second here now that we've um, brought him up uh you watched his videos and of course he impacted you and his teachings impacted you how would you describe him to to someone out there that you're introducing to the religion well it would be 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 so hard to do him justice that's that's the thing it would be so hard to do him do him justice but he he is the wisest person i've ever experienced i've i've ever heard speak in my entire life he speaks with such patience and such compassion and such knowledge there is there is an air about him this really beautiful and authentic and his his kindness his his just respect for humanity and his clear desire to bring all peoples together you can tell when this man speaks there is not an ounce of ego in him it's not about him it's about him doing his role that's given to him by god and and that is a man that that i would follow to the end that's a very unique man oh, and i'm just happy to be back that's i mean yeah he is um he is uh, the savior of mankind that every religion has spoken about and uh, as you said you know when you uh when you found his shorts uh, you know it just clicked with you you know he brought together all the missing puzzles of the pieces that you were looking for that you couldn't find uh within Judaism and Christianity when you tried to place them together you know you found the missing piece but what was it what was that moment or that speech or that teaching or whatever it was that made you feel like okay now's the time now's the time for me to pledge my allegiance now's the time for me to to submit to god's will that this is a man who he wanted me to find and the man that i have to swear my loyalty to yes well the f- the first um full video i watched was was the story of noah and the story of the um of the flood and retold in a completely new way still keeping all the originals but with so many of the missing pieces mm-hmm. explained and there was something about getting on that ark that that i i i dreamt about like a flood since since and i don't think i've ever dreamt about a flood and it was something about that i want to be one of the people on the ark wow and it was and it was that feeling that just grew like a seed and it grew and i suppose it if i'm completely honest i thought what am i waiting for what am i waiting for i know this is the the truth and it's it's a hard thing to reach out and put yourself out there and say like hey you know this is something i i believe because i'm fishy if you're quite like a shy person but it was like i believe this i don't want to waste another second so 
So I, I, I knew and I just wanted to be a, a, a part of this, even, you know, even if perhaps I'm the only one who who is in my area, you know, who, who believes this, I, I, I need to be a part of this. It was a, a need. This is where I belong. This is the truth. SubhanAllah. Yeah, beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's such a beautiful that you described, you know, your whole idea of it like being like an ark, you know, the ark of salvation, because, you know, the uh, the family Muhammad, they even described themselves saying that uh, we are the ark of Noah. You know, those who embark on us are saved and those who uh, abandon our ark or those who abandon us, uh, they are the ones who, uh, who end up drowning. So the comparison of what you said really uh, made me remember that one narration that uh, I would constantly read. Uh, on my journey um, uh, with the call. Uh, but, you know, there are those who embark on the ark and uh, they do have struggles, you know, like uh, even Noah had his own struggle when he embarked on the ark in, yeah. the, uh, in the Quran when he said, hey God, my son, you know, he's not, he's not a part of, uh, of the ark or hey, he's going to be amongst those who uh, drown. So did you face any struggles uh, in, your, uh, in, in the process of you coming into the call or, um, or uh, how was it for you? I mean, it I, what I found difficult is probably being um, originally feeling quite alone in it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, reaching out to the community, the community have been fantastic. So I certainly don't feel that way anymore. That's but good. you feel, <laughs> but you certainly can feel um, a guilt in leaving behind, like because the Jewish community were fantastic. They were so kind to me, and the Catholic community within my my, my local town are amazing. So it's you feel. Um, my daughter went to a Catholic school, so even though we weren't Catholic, they were amazing towards us. And it was, um, it's hard kind of saying, hey, I'm, I'm, we're not part of these, these communities anymore. Um, it's a whole new community, and, and you feel a little, little bit kind of isolated. But as I said, like, um, I, I don't anymore. I certainly don't anymore. Um, it's been a beautiful, a beautiful transition. I suppose it, it is, it would be nice to be, um, it would be nice if there were so many more people, but I suppose there will be in time. You know, it's, it's, it will, there will be in time, so it's patience. Yeah, it's definitely a matter of time and it's growing as we speak every day. There are hundreds of new believers that are just joining this call and, and supporting the Qaim of Asadik under that banner because we want to make this world a better place. Uh, which includes the divine just state, the concept of the divine just state, and you brought that up as well earlier. Uh, how would you describe a divine just state and how is it that we can support that that movement or that cause oh i'm reading about it, it seems kind of like a heaven on earth a, a state where everybody has what they need nobody has more than one another there is true justice the corruption of this world ends we can we can work towards ending sickness and and pain and we can, everybody can do their part based on their capabilities. I think that just sounds perfect. Right now we live in a world where some people have, have not got enough money to feed their, their children and other people are buying their third car. You know, it, it, it just seems ridiculous that this is the world that we've, we've created yeah. and the world that we, we go along with, you know, we participate in. And it, it just seems to me that it's, it's odd that in, in Scotland we would say we're a, a Christian country. Well, I don't think Jesus would have agreed with any of this. You know, so how can we say we're a Christian country? Absolutely. It's, it just seems like we, we don't really believe in the religions we claim to, you know. And, um, but in the divine just state with the divine ruler, that would be different. We wouldn't have these people who are only after looking up for themselves, leading us. And we could actually care for each other rather than competing for the scraps that there are. We can share and we can share fairly and we can help each other. And to me, that's something I want to work towards. God willing. Donna, you know, um, there are those out there who will be listening to your words and uh, a lot of them might actually share similarities with you in terms of your background. Do you have any words for the viewers out there who might be wondering, how can I take that step or what's my first step towards this? What would you like to inspire them with from yourself, from your experiences? I think it's the best thing I've ever done. And I mean that sincerely and I don't say that lightly at all. I would say to them, keep reading, keep watching the videos, definitely read The Goal of the Wise. It is 
life changing. It will actually, it will confirm things that you knew and it will add context and it will fill in the gaps. It will really expand your knowledge and it will make sense to you. I would say reach out. This is a wonderful community, wonderful people. You know, it's it's nothing to be frightened of. It's reach out, ask more, ask questions, seek seek the truth, seek knowledge. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Reach out, ask. If you have if you have if you have anything you want to know, reach out and ask. It's um, it really is a, a religion for everybody. This is the true religion of our time. Don't don't let fear stop you. Don't let the fear, whether it's fear of being stupid or fear of how people around you will treat you, do it. Just 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 do it. Keep learning and reach out. And there's always one of us who will, who will happily help you in any way we can. Thank you so much, Donna. It was such a pleasure discussing this with you. It really was. We really enjoyed this conversation. And I hope uh, people out there will listen to this and, and be inspired and take heed from it. So God bless you for, for being uh, an inspiration to many. And uh, thank you so much once again. Thank you so much, both of you. God bless. Thank you.